Okay, so we are recording now. It is a pleasure to introduce Charlotte Hutton, who requires no introduction because you all know her, but it's still better to make an introduction because this will be on YouTube soon. And not everybody in YouTube knows, knows Charlotte yet, but this will change soon. Anyway, uh, Charlotte is going to uh, tell us uh, about some uh, neural network related to mathematics. And it's a pleasure to have you here. So please pick it up from here, Charlotte. Oh, thank you so much for having me uh, here virtually at the Rochester Combinatoric Seminar. Um, okay, so I am going to go ahead and uh, I am gonna go ahead and share my screen so that we can see my slides here. All right, so um, I have the usual diagnostic stuff to do first. So first of all, can everyone see this, uh, this slide that says uh, universal algebra gives universal approximation for neural nets? Yes. Yes, okay, fantastic. Um, second diagnostic thing, can you see this white scribble here? Yes. Okay, perfect. Then we're, we are up and running. Um, so uh, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, how tools from algebra can be used to give a uh, sort of discrete universal approximation result for neural nets. Um, and although this sounds like it might be a talk on algebra or on computer science or analysis related to computer science, the tools fundamentally are combinatorial. And so uh, by the end of the talk, we will see how combinatorics is doing all of the heavy lifting here. Okay, so I first tried looking into the formal mathematical treatment of neural nets sometime during the year 2019. At the time, the only class of results that I found were universal approximation theorems. And I'll describe what those are a little later. Uh, variants of the original results of Sybenko from 89 and Hornick from 91 are still being published. Uh, I believe that neural nets are a little bit more fashionable now than they used to be, and so uh, there is still active work in this area. Since I have a universal algebra background, I naturally asked, doesn't Mirsky's theorem say something quite similar to what these results say? Uh, and now I'm going to spend the rest of this talk explaining what I mean by this. So for an outline of the talk, first I'll uh, discuss the basics of neural nets and universal approximation results, um, in particular Sybenko's result, which is sort of the original one. And then I'll talk about uh, discrete neural nets, which are my discretization of this concept, and finite algebras. Then I'll talk about clones and primality, which will finally give me enough tools from universal algebra I need to state Mirsky's theorem. I'll then discuss how that theorem actually can be interpreted as a discrete approximation theorem for neural nets. And finally, give a sketch of the proof in which we will see that uh, it really is combinatorics at the end of the day that is giving us this result. Okay. Oh, and uh, I guess I should say, um, feel free to stop me with questions. Um, I would like to actually get through the proof in the next um, 45 minutes, hopefully, but uh, it's only gonna be a sketch no matter what. So um, the most important thing to me is that everyone understands at least the statement of the result, even if um, we have to skip some details of the proof. Okay, uh, so I'm going to give a definition of neural net, which is uh, fairly standard uh, for anyone who is an expert listening to this, I might use some slightly non-standard terminology, but you can see that uh, morally this is the same thing. So uh, for us, a neural net is going to be a collection of sets V1 through VR of nodes, an edge set E and uh, this assignment phi where uh, VE is a finite digraph, which we call the architecture of the neural net. And for each uh, little, no little v that's a node in uh, this collection v, uh, besides the first layer, as it's going to be called, uh, we have a function that assigns to that node a map from r to the row of v to r, which is called the activation function of the node v. So this uh, set v that I'm discussing up here um, and evilly defining slightly later is uh, the union of all of these vi 
and we consider this the collection of nodes in the neural net. Um, the only edges in our digraph E go from vertices in the i-th layer to the i plus first layer uh, for i strictly less than r, so there are no edges coming out of the last layer. Uh, this row of V is the in degree of the vertex V in our digraph, and uh, every vertex except the ver vertices in the last layer have a uh, non-zero out degree. Okay, so that's kind of a mouthful, especially if you've never seen neural nets before, but uh, this is a nice formal definition. And now I have a picture of a typical neural net, which should make the situation pretty evident. So. Uh, here I've actually uh, labeled my nodes. Um, so, for example, this is my this is my first layer uh, v1. This is my second layer uh, v2, and this is my third layer v3. You can see by my handwriting and these uh, attempts at ovals that I do not have the steadiest hand, which is why it's nice that we have things like asymptote uh, that allow me to draw pictures like this. Uh, so. <laughs> Within each of these layers, I'm going to label my nodes. So this would be V11, V12, V13, and so forth for these other two layers. So this would be 3, 2. OK. So a particular node is called a neuron. So Vij is a neuron in layer i. It's the jth neuron in layer i. And uh, this phi of Vij, I'm just going to denote by uh, little phi ij, that's the ij activation function. And we have something different going on in the first layer. We are thinking of uh, these x1, x2, x3 as variables that are labeling the nodes in the first layer or the neurons in the first layer. And uh, it will become clear later why we're doing that. So, um, okay, so I'm not going to spend too long discussing the motivation, but the idea is that uh, neural nets are some kind of uh, representation of something like uh, a human or other creatures brain. And these things can be uh, trained in order to uh, approximate functions or represent functions. And I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit more uh, later. But this is the basic picture to keep in mind. And again, notice that there are only edges from the i-th layer to the i plus first layer, and no edges coming out of the last layer. And so we think of this first layer as inputs, and this last layer as outputs. OK. So our activation functions are typically restricted to a nicer class of functions than just all functions. The standard family consists of these sigmoid functions, uh, which are described here. And there's a parameter w in the appropriate uh, real vector space called the weight of this uh, sigmoid function. So in applications, neural nets are initialized with some fixed architecture, uh, which again was that underlying digraph I discussed before, and some randomly chosen weights, which really are specifying those activation functions uh, from this special family. And then they're trained by adjusting these weights somehow, which will then produce a different neural net whose activation functions also come from the same sigmoid family. In this talk, we will consider how this training is performed, but only what the goal of the training is. And so I kind of alluded to that before, but I will now describe it in greater detail. In order to understand what that goal is, we need to see that neural nets represent functions. Our example neural net represents a function uh, mapping vectors in R3 to vectors in R2. And so I'm just going to informally describe to you how I can see what function this neural net represents. And then I'll give you a formal definition and wave my hands and say, this is clearly the thing that I was just doing. So uh, I have that function written down here. Okay, so that's a little bit of a mess, but let's see what's going on. Um, so first of all, this uh, g of x1, x2, x3 is actually uh, taking three arguments and, and giving us two out because uh, here's the first output and here's the second component of the output. Okay, so how do I arrive at, say, what this first component of the output is? Well, uh, what I can do is I can think of that component of the output as the thing that is coming out of 
V31 or out of um, the node V31. Uh, so of course there's no edge coming out of this node, but I can think of this as representing uh, the function, whatever it is, phi of 3, 1, applied to uh, these two nodes which are entering into it. And so these would be uh, phi 2, 1 of whatever it eats, and then phi 2, 2 applied to whatever it eats. Now, uh, because of the definition of these activation functions, uh, phi 3, 1 does actually have um, does take two real arguments, and so this is well defined. Now I can continue this process by looking at, say, phi 2, 1 and seeing what goes into phi 2, 1. Well, that's just this node v 1, 1, which has a label of x1, the variable I'm thinking of as, as x1. OK, so that's what gets fed into phi 2, 1. Now phi 2, 2 has three, uh, three nodes with edges coming into it which are labeled by x1, x2, and x3, respectively. And that's where the x1, x2, and x3 argument comes from here. And we can perform a similar process on the second node to get the second component of uh, this function g. And so that function g is the function that's represented by this neural net, assuming that we actually have specific activation functions in mind. All right. Now. Here's where I wave my hands and say, this is exactly the thing that I was just showing you uh, uh, with some number of no or some number of layers R, then uh, the function represented by this neural net and R is GR mapping the appropriate uh, dimensional real space to the appropriate dimensional real space where those dimensions are the number of input and output nodes where Okay, well, if R is one, we should just have the identity. We think of that neural net as just having nodes labeled by variables and it doesn't do anything to them. So that's the simplest possible case. And then for R greater than one, we uh, recursively define these functions. Uh, so uh, we take our GR applied to X, we look at the Jth component of that. Well, the Jth component of that is obtained by taking the J activation function in our last layer. And then uh, what this uh, expression afterwards represents is the vector, which is obtained by looking at all of the nodes which have uh, edges coming into uh, the node Vij. And then for each of those nodes with an edge coming in to Vij, uh, we are, or to Vrj, excuse me, uh, with each of those, okay, so for each edge coming into VRJ, we're going to actually look at what the corresponding function represented by the neural net that we get is where we chop off the last layer of the neural net we're considering. And so that's this recursive process, which builds these functions up, starting with the identity and applying the activation functions. This is also uh, called the feed forward process in the algorithm of uh, using neural nets for machine learning. Okay. So the way I wrote this definition actually depends on the ordering that uh, I implicitly placed on the layers VI uh, when I gave that example. But if you really want to consider this as an abstract mathematical object that doesn't depend on that ordering, it is possible to undo the ordering at the expense of a slightly, uh, a slightly longer definition. Uh, but I, I won't do that for now because I just want to get across the basic idea that neural nets can represent functions in this way. Okay, so the goal of training then is to produce from some neural net with a specified architecture and starting weights or starting activation functions, a neural net with the same architecture, so we're not gonna change the architecture, which represents maybe with some small error that we can tolerate, a given target function, which is mapping um, R to the number of nodes in V1 to R to the number of nodes in, oh, this is uh, not V2, but rather VR. So in other words, the number of inputs should be, or the, the dimension of the input vector should be the number of, of nodes in the first layer and the dimension of the output vector should be the number of nodes in the last layer. Yeah, so this should be the size of VR over here. All right. 
So uh, now that I've discussed what neural nets are, I can talk about universal approximation. So we're going to discuss a simplified version of Sedbenko's result as an example of universal approximation for neural nets. Sedbenko considers a neural net with three layers, which would be an input, an output layer, and then one in between, uh, whose activation functions are all either from the sigmoid family we described above or our uh, nullary or constant functions, which we think of as parameters, or are the dot product, the usual dot product in Rn. Uh, these last two cases usually aren't um, mentioned in other treatments of this because the exact formal setup of neural nets is slightly different, but I promise that this tweak isn't a big deal and it's just going to help me to um, move into the setting I want to later on. Okay, so each function in the sigmoid family can actually be written as a single function, uh, sigma, which is what is usually referred to as the activation function in other treatments of this topic, uh, composed with uh, a dot product between some argument, uh, argument Z and some set of weights W. Uh, that sigmoid function is this. And so each constant function can actually just view, be viewed as its image which is typically uh, labeled as uh, theta as some real number. And those are often thought of as just additional parameters in the neural net. Okay. So uh, such a neural net, no S there, <laughs> such a neural net can be constructed to represent any function of the form uh, G of C is uh, this, sum, this linear combination of uh, sigma dot wi plus theta i's. Uh, so that can be done. Exercise left to the viewer, uh, try to write down what that neural net should look like. So if we now partition the uh, n-dimensional uh, unit cube into uh, disjoint measurable subsets, say p1 through ps or some finite uh, s, then we can uh, we can create a decision function for that partition, which is a map taking the cube to the real numbers where uh, H applied to some vector Z just spits out the label on the partition. So for example, if Z was in P3, then H of that Z would be three. Um, and so this is just telling us for each, um, for each vector, which uh, member of the partition, it, which, part, which set in the partition it lies in. Okay, so why am I all of a sudden talking about these decision functions on the cube? Well, decision functions are sufficiently general to cover all the target functions we'd want to consider when um, applying neural nets to real world tasks. Of course, it would probably be way too extreme to ask that uh, neural nets should represent well any function or even any measurable function. Uh, and so this is a this is a much more realistic class to consider. All right, so now I can state Sybenko's 1989 theorem, which says that if we have a decision function H um, for some finite measurable partition of the cube, then for any epsilon greater than zero, there is a neural net of the form described previously. So it's a, it's a it's a constru it's a pretty constructive <laughs> statement. Uh, which represents a function like this, as I discussed before. Uh, and we can also find some subset of the cube, uh, which is only missing epsilon much of the total measure of the cube, on which, uh, on which this function g and the target function h uh, disagree only by, um, only by at most epsilon uh, for all z. Oh, and I apologize. I know it's a little bit evil. I'm using Z again to represent a real parameter. I should have said that before. I mean, I did, I am saying real all over the place, but yes, yeah, Z is a real number. Uh, so Saibenko actually proved something more general, but this is enough for our purposes. This result shows that there is a neural network with R equals three, which is also called a one hidden layer neural network because there's one layer that's not the input or the output layer which represents with arbitrary precision any target function we could reasonably choose, where again, reasonably choosing a function means choosing it from that, uh, that class of functions uh, 
decision functions defined previously. Okay. Have we fixed the architecture yet or? Oh, yeah. So yeah, thank, thank you, Gail. That's actually a really good question. So, um, okay. So saying there is a neural net means there is a neural net with some architecture. The architecture actually is going to is going to depend on what the, the function is that, that we um, that we want to represent. Um, but there are all, all, all of these in all of these cases, we're going to be able to do it with only three layers. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so now um, I said that I'm going to be doing some discrete version of this and everything I just talked about was um, certainly not discrete. It was from analysis on the real numbers. So uh, now I'm going to define a discrete neural net. And this definition is exactly the definition I gave for a neural net before, except now, instead of the real numbers, I'm going to take uh, A to be a finite set. And I'm going to replace uh, functions. Um, I'm going to replace n -ary functions on the real numbers with n -ary functions on the set A, taking tuples of things in A to A itself. Uh, that's the only difference between uh, the neural nets I was talking about before and these discrete neural nets, which I'm always thinking of as living on a finite set, A. Okay, so I won't draw the picture again, but of course you can still picture them with exactly the same picture from before. But now all of my phi ijs are, are operations on a finite set and not operations on the real numbers. Okay, so to my knowledge, although again, I'm not claiming to be a total expert on all of this, uh, this analog of neural nets hasn't been discussed before. Um, so, but I'm still, I'm still new, so I don't know. Uh, functions represented by discrete neural nets and target functions for discrete neural nets are defined analogously. So I'm not gonna give you those definitions again, but you can imagine playing the same games since I didn't use anything special about the real numbers to define those. Now, training a discrete neural net should be done by varying the activation functions among those in some chosen family. And the goal of training is still to produce from a neural net with a specified architecture. So now we're fixing the architecture and um, some starting activation functions, uh, another neural net with the same architecture, which represents um, with maybe some small error, a target function mapping tuples over the set A to different size tuples over the set A. Oh, and again here I wrote down V2 and what I really mean is VR, as in the number of outputs should be the number of things in the output layer, the last layer. Okay, so uh, universal approximation for discrete neural nets then has to do with uh, which such functions H can be written as composites of some fixed, say, finite family of operations on the set A. So if we could understand, uh, if we could understand that, um, what happens when I take a finite set of operations on a set A and then compose them however I'd like, understanding that is equivalent to understanding what universal approximation looks like for uh, discrete neural nets, where that collection of functions depends on uh, what my, those are basically what my activation functions are that I chose. Okay. So now I will segue from that into uh, giving a really quick crash course on, okay, maybe not all of universal algebra, but just the concepts that I need in order to state Mirsky's theorem. And so uh, unfortunately this won't even be all of the concept, concepts that are needed to actually prove it, but we're going to slip a whole bunch of that under the rug. <laughs> okay, but I hope at this point I've at least convinced you that understanding these really general collections of operations on finite sets is, is somehow the same thing as understanding this universal approximation in the discrete finite setting. Okay, so operations, um, although I've already been using the word, uh, now I will formally define what they are. Operations are rules for combining elements of a set together to obtain another element from the same set. So if we have some set A, and some n in this to me is the whole numbers. I know that this is also slightly evil. To me, the natural numbers start with one and this is zero, one, two, et cetera. Um, okay, 
So when I use a W, uh, Blackboard W, that means whole numbers, which include zero, and N is the positive integers. All right, so again, I'm sorry about that. Uh, okay, so um, given some um, whole number N in a set A, an n-ary operation on A is just a function from the nth Cartesian power of A to itself. Um, all right, and so as an exercise, make sure that you understand that a zero area operation amounts to choosing an element of the set A and the other ones are more natural to understand. And we say that an n area operation has arity n. Those are the same, the same thing. All right. Now, algebras are sets with an index sequence of operations. And so uh, if you're wondering what an example of an algebra is in the sense of universal algebra, the standard thing to keep in mind is, uh, is a group. A group is an algebra. Uh, it has its group multiplication, inversion, and a special chosen element, which is the identity. Okay, so an algebra, as I just said, consists of a set and then some sequence f of fi's, where each i is an operation on A. And so we say that an algebra is finite when the underlying set or universe of the algebra is a finite set. Uh, whether or not A is finite, it's conventional to assume that that the index set i is finite uh, in most cases, as we will for the rest of this talk. So we're just going to consider a set, which in our context is going to be a finite set, equipped with a finite collection of operations on that set. And again, we're thinking of those operations as the activation functions that we can choose for our neural net. Now, given an algebra, we can actually define a map taking that index set to the whole numbers including zero, uh, where rho of i is the arity of the ith operation, so the number of arguments it takes. So for example, the, the multiplication on a group would have arity two because it takes two arguments and combines them together to give another group element. So this map is of the algebra A, and it's well-defined because uh, n area operations are not k area operations for any other k. Uh, when two algebras have the same similarity type, uh, we say that A and B are similar algebras. All right, so now we only usually want to consider algebras of the same similarity type together. It's the most natural thing to do. Um, okay, like we don't talk about homomorphisms between, um, at least not directly, we don't talk about homomorphisms between groups and um, rings, for example, uh, because they don't have the same similarity type and ignore that there are group rings for, for this comment. Um, okay, so if we have a similarity type and some natural number, and again, now I mean this to be the positive integers, not including zero, although I think Grote and Deke would be mad at me, uh, we are going to define the set of algebras of signature row um, where this n is now the, um, this n is now the size of the universe of the algebra or the order of the algebra. Uh, that's going to be all of the algebras with uh, the similarity type row whose universe is the standard set of n elements, which we can take to be 1, 2, up through n, or 0 through n minus 1 if you're of that religion. OK, so uh, this algebra n is then the set of all algebras of this type uh, with n elements in their universe. OK. And so this is actually a finite set, even though, of course, the class of all algebras of this type of, air, of size n is actually um, a proper class. All right. So if we have a property P of finite algebras, we can consider only those members of algebra n which have that property. And that set is denoted this way. The probability that a finite algebra of type rho has some property P is then defined to be the limit as n goes to infinity of the proportion of those algebras of, uh, of order n that have that property over the total proportion of algebras of that order. So uh, this actually defines a finitely additive probability measure on the set of all finite algebras of signature row, which is just the union of all of these sets, algebra n over all possible n. And uh, we're not going to include uh, n equals zero here. Um, because we don't want to consider empty algebras. Okay, 
So, and of course, the measurable, the measurable functions here are the ones for which this limit actually exists. And those, those are the ones that have this measure associated to them and so forth. Now, uh, we'll need to keep track of all the functions which can be built by using the basic operations of an algebra, composing them together as we would do in uh, feeding forward in a neural net. So given some whole number n and a set A, I'm going to define op n A to be the set of all n -ary operations on A. So this A to the A to the n is the same thing as the set of all functions mapping A to the n into A. Oh, that's a sad looking A, but OK, fine. <laughs> Okay, so now if we have two whole numbers, uh, some n area operation on A, and then n many k area operations on A, there's a generalized composite function, which I get by uh, essentially plugging g1 up through gn into each of the respective slots of the function add. And so if I want to actually compute what f generalized composite with each of these g's is, then that eats a, a k tuple of elements of A, and it spits out this single element of A, which is f applied to g1 up through gn, each separately applied to this, this vector x. OK, so note that the n-ary operations on A actually uh, contain all of the coordinate projection operations, which are given by just picking out the k uh, coordinate of a tuple. Now it's time to discuss clones. Uh, so there's a little bit of a biological uh, flavor here, I suppose. Uh, given a non-empty set A, we're going to say that a collection C of operations on A, which can be of any arity, is a clone when C is closed under that generalized composition operation and contains all of the coordinate projections. So. Uh, the largest clone on a set A is the one that consists of all operations. The smallest clone is the clone of projections on A, which just consists of all of those projection operations. And there are other clones in between that are bigger than the projections, but smaller than all of the operations on A. So clones themselves can be uh, viewed as algebras, but that treatment isn't necessary here, and I don't want to think too much about it, but, but they can be. Uh, now, for topologists, I want to comment that clones are examples of operads whose operation spaces are discrete. Um, and for what it's worth, clone theory is much older. Uh, it dates back to at least the 1940s. Um, and so I guess as a bonus exercise for topology people, uh, think about what it is that I'm about to say would, would be in the case that our operation spaces were not discrete and were some more interesting space. OK, now that I have clones, I'm going to need to tell you how to produce from a finite algebra a corresponding clone. And that's the clone that I'll be discussing when I talk about Mirsky's theorem. So given some similarity type, a set of variables x and a set of basic operations, or basic operation symbols, excuse me, I, that's why I wrote this, basic operation symbols. So these, the, these FIs are not operations. They're not maps. They're just some formal symbols, the same way that the variables are. A term in the language of rho in these variables is an element of the set of terms, t rho, on the variables x, where I recursively define this collection by starting off with the variables. And then this is all of the zero area or constant functions in my collection. And so if that still stresses you out uh, because you haven't completed the exercise from the beginning of this talk, don't worry about it. Just, just forget it for now. Uh, and so then I can recursively define the next set by saying, well, take the previous set and then also throw in all of the generalized, formal generalized composites that you get. So this isn't still an actual function, but just a formal symbol where I think of this as composing fi with each of these terms, t1 up through tk. Uh, where these are expressions that I had defined in the previous layer. All right. And so these can be thought of as formal strings of symbols that are appropriately built up by the basic operations. Oh, and that's also what I say here. That is, this is all of the formal composites of the basic operation symbols uh, who, whose arities are given by this, uh, this signature row with variables coming from the set X. 
Now, if I have an algebra A of signature rel in some term, I can define a term operation, which is an actual function mapping n tuples of things in A to elements of A. Uh, by interpreting all of those operation symbols as being actual operations on A in the natural way. So for a very concrete example of this, if rho is the usual signature for groups, which allows us to multiply, take inverses, and use the identity if we want to, then uh, xy times x inverse y inverse is a term in the variables xy. That's just a term in the signature of groups. It's not itself a function, it's just a formal string of symbols which are appropriately combined. But there is an actual commutator term operation, oh, because this term is the, com is the commutator in group theory. There is an actual commutator term operation on the symmetric group S3, which is actually a binary operation that maps a pair of permutations of a set of three elements to another permutation on the set of three elements. And so that's the difference between a term T and the corresponding term operation, which I denote by t to the a. Now, each algebra has a corresponding clone of term operations, which is defined to be the union of all of these n clo n's of a, where each one of these is the interpretation in a of each term, which eats the appropriate number of variables in the appropriate signature. And so, this is all of the operations on A, which can be built using the basic operations of A. And uh, implicitly here, we're using projections in order to plug variables into the uh, slots of the deepest, most nested functions. Another way of saying this is that uh, the clone of A is the smallest clone in the lattice of clones on, on the set A, which contains the basic operations of the algebra A. OK. So we say that an algebra A is primal when for each positive uh, natural number, we have that the uh, n area operations in the clone of A actually are all of the operations. So primal algebras are those which allow us to express any non-constant operation as a composite of their basic operations. So these are the maximally expressive algebras, the primal algebras. And we're in particular interested in finite primal algebra correspond to the finite sets of operations, which allow us to build neural nets, which are maximally expressive. So finite fields of the form FP for a prime P, even, even two, if you allow two to be prime, uh, those are primal. Uh, finite fields um, FP to the K for K greater than one are actually not primal. However, this is really not morally true. Uh, there's a more general concept and that we won't talk about called functional completeness. Okay, maybe I'll talk about it a little bit. But the thing to keep in mind with both of these examples is that um, any n area operation on the underlying set of a finite field can be written as a polynomial um, in terms of uh, in ter with coefficients in that finite field, some n area polynomial um, or some n variable polynomial with coefficients in that finite field. And that, that can be proven essentially by linear algebra, write down a polynomial with enough uh, variables and um, allow your coefficients to be variables. You can, um, you can use linear algebra to solve for what the coefficients need to be for any specified function. The only difference between FP and FP squared or FP cubed is that you can obtain every element of FP by adding one to itself. And you can't do that for FP squared or FP cubed, but Okay, that's a, a bit of a technicality. Um, all right, so now there are other examples of primal algebras, which include the two element Boolean algebra, uh, B2, which is uh, the algebra that we use uh, doing digital <laughs> Boolean logic or just logic in mathematics. JV Nation actually has an excellent survey of logic on other planets, which describes other primal or functionally complete, which again includes this example of finite fields uh, which are not just FP. Um, he has a survey of, of, uh, of these algebras which play the role of B2 in alien computer systems. Some of these algebras are even based on the game Rock, Paper, Scissors. Um, but uh, if you know me, I like that a lot, but uh, I won't talk about it now. So we're gonna introduce one last notion related to primality. An operation is said to be idempotent 
when if I take any one element and plug it into every slot of that operation, I just get that element out. And so this is similar to idempotent matrices or other things that you may have heard called idempotent. And algebra is called item primal when its clone contains not all operations, but all idempotent operations on the set A. So this is a, a weaker condition than being primal. Now, uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to let P denote not an arbitrary property, but the property of being primal. And I'm going to let I denote the property of being item primal. In 1968, R.O. Davies proved that if rho is a similarity type where there's at least one K area operation symbol, or with K strictly greater than one, so maybe binary, ternary, then the probability that a finite algebra of signature rho is primal is one over E. In the 1970s, V.L. Mirsky proved that under the same assumption on rho, the probability that, uh, an uh, that a randomly chosen finite algebra of signature rho is item primal is one. <laughs> Essentially all finite algebras of signature rho, where that signature has a single K area operation with K at least one, essentially all of those are item primal. It's guaranteed. Uh, we also, or we, he also proved a result about primality for signatures with more basic operations. Okay, but even this result you can already see is essentially saying that if I construct some neural net whose basic, whose activation functions are coming from, are consists of a single randomly chosen uh, K area operation with K at least two, then I'm guaranteed to be able to represent all idempotent operations on that set. With, okay, guaranteed with probability one, I will be able to do it with probability one. Uh, okay, so now what I'm calling Mirsky's theorem, which was uh, proven in a couple of different papers in the 1970s, says that if rho is a similarity type with at least two basic operations, at least one of which is not unary, so at least one of which has arity greater than one, then the probability that a randomly chosen algebra of signature rho is primal, or in other words, can be used to express any operation at all on the set, is one. So essentially all finite algebras are primal with this very mild assumption on the signature error. Uh, this might be kind of surprising because if we look back at our examples, um, well, saying that you can use linear algebra to represent n-ary operations as polynomials over finite fields, it, that seems kind of special because it's, you know, it's using linear algebra over, over field. And then uh, with a Boolean algebra, uh, two-element Boolean algebra, well, okay, you know, um, I kind of know that from logic, right? That's, that's believable. This thing about rock, paper, scissors might be a little weird, but I'm sure there are other examples. Well, it turns out that actually this is the typical behavior of a finite algebra. This is not anything special. Okay, so uh, if we interpret this in our context, and this is what I was saying before, if rho is a similarity type, which contains at least two basic operations, at least one of which is not unary, then a randomly selected finite algebra A of signature rho has with probability one, the property that given any target function mapping n tuples of A into m tuples of A, there exists some discrete neural net whose architecture depends on the, on the function that we're trying to represent, whose activation functions are all basic operations of A or projections um, or projections. So this or projections isn't a big deal. That's just having again to do with allowing us to plug variables into the innermost uh, nested layer, or in other words, in, in, the, first, in the first layer. OK, so uh, at this point, are there any questions? Well, if not, then I am going to now uh, very quickly, since we started, uh, Alex, what do you think? Since we started oh, at- uh, Take uh, all the time you want. This is really interesting stuff. OK, thank you. All right, so I apologize. I apologize for taking so long to get to the actual um, combinatorics, but uh, here, here is a sketch of the proof of Mirsky's theorem that a randomly chosen finite algebra is primal. Um, and here's where all of the combinatorics is really happening. So, um, all right, so 
the proof that uh, randomly chosen finite algebra is primal um, has, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. The proof that a randomly chosen finite algebra is primal with probability one, uh, given that rho has at least two basic operations, at least one of which is non-unary, is relatively direct once we know that the probability that such an algebra is uh, item primal is one um, in the case that rho has only a single binary operation. So knowing that a single binary operation gives you item primal with probability one, that can be used to uh, show that you have, for this slightly bigger signature, primal with probability one. And so I'm going to refer to a, a finite, um, I'm going to refer to an algebra with a single binary operation. So a set A equipped with a map from A squared to A. I'm going to refer to this as a magma. These are also called groupoids and binars, uh, but I will call them magmas. So uh, one can show that a finite algebra is primal if and only if it is item primal and has no trivial subalgebras. So if we let E denote the property of having no trivial subalgebras, in other words, um, a single a single element, um, you know. So in other words, you have a trivial subalgebra when when F if you have only a single basic operation F of arbitrary arity when F of A A A A is just A. That's what it means to have a trivial subalgebra. The singleton set A is itself an algebra under that operation. Well, all right. So, uh, uh, so groups always have trivial subalgebras, for example, because they contain the trivial subgroup. Well, the property of being item primal, or I'm sorry, the property of being primal is then precisely the property that um, is precisely having um, this property E intersect with I when those are viewed as, as subsets of uh, the collection of all finite algebras on that signature, as we defined previously. We're going to denote by uh, I with a bar over at the complement of I in the set of finite algebras of signature rho. It's going to follow from the fact that the clone of an algebra with a single k-ary operation for k um, at least two has a binary operation in its clone of term operations, that is, that uh, the probability, um, the probability uh, on the signature of an algebra being item primal is one for any row with a single k area operation. So that is, if we can show it for just the case of magmas, we'll have it for the case of all algebras with a single k area operation for bigger arity. So it really does just reduce to this one case of showing that magmas are essentially always item primal. Uh, so we, it turns out we have the probability that a randomly chosen algebra has uh, no trivial subalgebras. Um, we have that with probability one. In the case that rho has at least two operations, at least one of which is not unary. So now if we write the probability of having no trivial subalgebras as the disjoint union of that probability, given that the algebra is item primal, versus given that it's not item primal, then uh, we see that this first expression is actually exactly what it means to be primal. It turns out that primal is the same as item primal with no trivial subalgebras. And so from that, we have that one is this probability of having no trivial subalgebras, uh, which itself, because this, this probability measure was finitely additive, this is the same thing as the probability of getting a primal algebra plus the probability of this other situation, uh, no trivial subalgebras and not item primal. So uh, if we can show that the probability of uh, having an item primal algebra is one in this case, then we will actually have proven that the probability of having a primal algebra is, is one because this other term will go away. All right, so now I'm going to go through uh, a little bit of the proof that a random finite magma is item primal with probability one. This is done by splitting the class of non item primal magmas into 10 overlapping classes and showing that each of these occurs with probability zero. All right, so now if I have a finite magma of order n, um, if, if this magma A is not item primal, then at least one of the following things holds where capital X and Y are subsets of the universe A, little a, b, and c are elements of A, 
and alpha and beta are permutations of the set A. And so here are the 10 possible situations. At least one of these must occur, maybe more than one, but at least one of these must occur in order for a finite magma of order n to be uh, to fail to be item primal. So if you're not item primal, then at least one of these 10 things is happening. Now, I'm not going to go through all 10, but it turns out actually one of these is very special. And that very special condition is number two, which says that there's some subset X of A with size at least three, but at most N minus one, so that the size of the square of the set X, where this means the usual meaning of the symbol, all of the little x dot little y's, so that x and y are both in the set x, uh, the size of the square of this set is less than or equal to the size of the original set. Okay. So we're only going to consider case two, which again says this. One can show that for any condition, any of those other conditions, one through 10, a random magma satisfies condition C uh, and not condition two with probability zero. So with, so with probability one, if you're not item primal, then, then you satisfy condition two. So now we'll show that the probability that a random magma of order n satisfies condition two is, is, um, is at most the sum from k equals three to n minus one of psi n k, where the psi n k is n choose k squared times n over k to the k squared. Uh, so this can actually be seen by noting that condition two is equivalent to having two subsets where the size of these subsets is the same. Uh, they're both at least size three at most n minus one and x, x dot x, the product of all pairs of things in x, um, that set of elements is contained in the set y. So now um, if we consider x and y to both be k sets in A, so fixing some size for them, uh, then the probability that x times x is in y is the proportion of the Cayley tables uh, for the binary operation, which have k squared many um, positions, the ones corresponding to elements in x, to pairs of elements in x, those all have to take values in y. So in other words, we have to, for each of the k squared spots where we have a product of things in x, we have to put a thing in y into that spot. A particular spot in the Cayley table is in y with probability k over n because that's how there are k many things in y and there are n total elements to choose from. Since there are k squared spots and n choose, way, n choose k ways to choose each of x and y, the claim follows. So this is saying choose x, then choose y independently, and then uh, label each of these k squared spots uh, appropriately. Now, we'll be done if we can show that the limit as n goes to infinity of uh, the sum, where we have to sum over all possible sizes k that x and y could have, uh, that this is zero, because then that's, that's the probability that this situation too occurs. We can do this by showing that there are real numbers c and d strictly between zero and one, such that each of these, uh, each of these sums, where we split, up, uh, we split up the domain that we're summing over uh, according to c and d, uh, we, if we can show that each of these sums converges to zero as n goes to infinity, then, then we'll be done. Okay, so we're, again, we're splitting this up by taking k, taking k from three up to c times n, which is some proportion of n, and then going from cn to dn, and finally from dn up to, k, up to n minus one. All right, so we'll just look at one of these cases uh, because there's, there, there's a lot to do. Uh, so we're going to show that there exists some D, which actually is strictly between one half and one, so that DN, um, so that if we sum all the Ks between DN and N minus one, um, if we sum over all those Ks, the Psi NK, we'll have that this goes to zero as N goes to infinity. So for this, we need a sharp version of Sterling's approximation for X factorial, which was given by Robbins in 1955. So for all x at least one uh, natural, we can think of x as a natural number, um, we actually have this estimate. This is Robin's sharp version of Sterling's approximation. Now, you can, one can show with, uh, for integers a and b, where a is strictly greater than b and b is at least one, that we obtain from that, um, from that estimate this bound on a choose b. 
which is which is this. Uh, if we take D strictly between one half and one, and we set U to be the floor of Dn, uh, which is the most uh, extreme value that we would that we would consider, um, because we're summing. Remember, we're summing from Dn up to n minus one, uh, and so this is uh, a bound on this side, a lower bound for what K could be, and that that's on. Then uh, we can actually use that bound to see that n choose u squared uh, is bounded above by this expression. And that in turn can be used to show that n, n choose u squared is at most um, is at most this quantity. And the reason we're concerned with n choose u again is that dn is a lower bound for what k can be in the sum. And since d is past uh, one half, we're getting past the point where now uh, n choose k is decreasing as k gets as k gets bigger. So that's why we're considering the lowest one. Uh, we also have by more elementary methods that k over n to the k squared is bounded above by n minus one over n to the dn squared. But this, this estimate for n choose u squared is really where the heavy lifting had to be done. Uh, combining these estimates gives us that psi n k is bounded above by this expression. And now when n is at least, or when n is strictly greater than four, we have that the limit as d approaches one from the left of, uh, of this expression is at least one. And so it, it does actually, it does actually, um, this, this expression does actually, uh, get pet, it's, yeah, this, okay, well, yeah, it's at least one. This, this there it is possible, sorry, I'm tripping over myself now. It is possible to actually choose a d less, strictly less than one which is large enough so that this inequality is, is realized. And so, uh, so from that, we actually, um, we actually have that psi n k is bounded above by n d to the n one minus d to the minus two. And from that, it follows that the size of this sum is at most n squared d to the n one minus d squared. Um, and so, uh, Right, and so as um, yeah, and so as as n goes to as n goes to infinity, this quantity is um, this quantity is going to zero um, because we have d uh, d strictly less than one, and so that's that's all to show that this one of those three terms that we split uh, the expression up into is going to zero as n goes to infinity. This was the hardest one; the others don't require um, as much effort. All right, so uh, that is everything I wanted to say. Um, besides that, uh, here are some references. I uh, took a look at Saibenko's original 1989 paper. I uh, looked at Munakata's uh, Fundamentals of the New Artificial Intelligence um, for Basics on Neural Nets. And uh, basically all of uh, what I described about Mirsky's theorem is the presentation that's given in Bergman's Universal Algebra text in chapter six. Um, well, thank you all so much for being here and listening to this talk. Hey, let's thank Charlotte for a very, very nice talk. Um, are there any questions? I'm going to have some detailed questions in the coming days, Charlotte. It's going to take me a bit of time to absorb some parts of this that I want to look in, uh, look at much deeper. Any any chance you can send me the the, um, the presentation? Uh, the, yeah, I'll I'll post I'll post a, a copy of it on my website, and then I'll I'll link I'll link you to that. Yes, yeah, so I've um, just by as an interesting coincidence, I gave a. Uh, talk on neural networks at the uh, CUNY machine learning seminar just a few days ago. And uh, this was a very different topic, but I was complaining. I've been complaining ever since because one of the theorems that I proved is that any Lipschitz function can be uh, approximated arbitrarily uh, closely by a feed forward neural net. And I've been complaining because Lipschitz functions never actually arise in any reasonable data set that I've ever looked at. Uh, but anyways, uh, but actually, but what you were describing is far more sophisticated than I wanted to. Yeah, actually that, well, okay. I mean, I, what, what I, 
Okay, well, I, I don't know about being far, far more sophisticated, but that reminds me, uh, the reason I said yeah is that reminds me I wanted to say and didn't say that um, <laughs> perhaps, of course, uh, although the techniques might not be the same, if we can accomplish these things in, in this discrete setting, then that naturally is applicable to the real world applications of neural nets because on classical computers, at least, we're always considering functions on finite sets. No, absolutely. There's, I mean, there's, there's no such thing as continuous objects in the real world. It, it, yeah, that's just a given. And, uh, I mean, it it might be a it might be a real loss. I don't know that there's a legitimate theory here, but it might be a real loss to not have the techniques of analysis, even if they don't, you know, appear in the actual objects that are produced in the end. But um, this does seem to indicate that it's at least possible to get by by uh, sort of shoving the analysis down into the, the combinatorial reasoning. Well, I mean, as a simple example, in the approximating Lipschitz functions by neural networks that I mentioned, I mean, how do you do that? You use the Lipschitz property by, by, uh, to achieve epsilon discretization, and then you take centers of those cubes, and there you go, you're working with a discrete object. But even if you don't assume that it's Lipschitz, if you assume that the graph has certain fractal dimension, for example, you can once again discretize and count. So this is completely natural. I mean, I, I don't have any, any doubts about that at all. Um, very, very cool. Any questions from the audience? No, if there are no questions from the audience, then let's thank Charlotte again. I really, really enjoyed this. And, you know, I was just wondering about something for future talks. I, I'm wondering if it makes sense to broadcast them on Facebook Live. Um, yeah, I, I am certainly not opposed to being broadcast live on the internet. Um, I'm actually not a Facebook person myself, but I'm not opposed to someone else broadcasting me there too. Oh, very, very cool. And uh, so um, so what I'll do is I will process the recording and I will uh, send it to you if you want to put it on YouTube. And, yeah, that, uh, that sounds fantastic. And then if you could alert me to what your YouTube channel is called, I will happily advertise it. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll send you I'll send you a link. Okay, so I'll stop recording.